somewhere amongst all the papers in, in there are some thoughts. I love the idea of time. Time is interesting to me. And I noticed that in the Sidur, the way they translate Baruch Ata Hashem, Elokeinu Melech HaOlam, Baruch Ata Adonai, it says, our God, sovereign of time and space, is how they are translating HaOlam, which really just means forever. It's a poetic translation, an expansive translation. But I love this idea that, you know, God is not not the sovereign of time and space, right? It's a different definition of what, what ha'olam might be. Because it intrigues me how we have formulated time, how we have formulated time, how we have shaped it, how we have ritualized time, and how time has molded us. In Genesis, the very beginning of Genesis, chapter 1, the fifth pasuk, the fifth, fifth verse, it says, Vayikra Elohim laor yom vela choshech kara laila. So we have light and we have, we have darkness and we call it the darkness uh, night. Vayi er vayi voker yom echad. And we have evening and we have morning and that is the first day, right? The creation of time doesn't even happen until the fifth, the fifth verse of the Torah. Or, of course, we've just completed counting the Omer, which is another way that we give shape to time. We count the 49 and the 50th day, um, and we do that, and you shall count for yourselves from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the Omer of the wave offering, seven complete Sabbaths, shall there be. And that's what we have done. We've just completed that counting, that intentionality of time. And of course, in later in Genesis, in chapter 8, we count the seasons. It says in verse 22 of chapter 8, so long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. And Rashi gives further explanation as to this idea of time, and he gives a long detail of what is summer, what is winter, what is spring, what is harvest, and he counts through the months. I don't need to go through all the months with you, but just half of Tishrei, Mar Cheshvan, and half of Kislev is the seeding time. And half of Kislev, uh, half of Kis Kislev, and Tevet and half of Shvat is the cold season. And winter, he says, is the time of sowing barley and things are quick to ripen. It is half of Shvat and Adar and half of Nisan. And he goes on and on. He breaks down the calendar so that we are looking at time each day. We are looking at time, how we build off of it. And we are even looking at seasons of it. And of course, in Ecclesiastes, a season is set for everything, a time for every experience under heaven, a time of being born and a time for dying, a time for planting and a time for uh, uprooting the planted, a time for slaying and a time for healing, a time for tearing down and a time for building up, right? Time is everywhere throughout the Sidor and throughout our, our texts. Time defines our days, our seasons, and in a sense, our purpose as well. So last week, I was leading our grief after loss session. And if you don't know about this, it's about quarterly, the same frequency as Yisker. And we gather here in the chapel it is for people who've experienced a recent loss, and it's a program started and nurtured by Rabbi Magdal and led by the clergy on a rotating basis. Recent loss is defined however people need it to be defined. The past few weeks or the past few years, it is less a matter of chronological time than emotional need. A husband who has died a decade ago or a child recently. 
look for look for these sessions as they come up and please know that there is a place for you here in these sessions so last shabbat i was introduced to an interesting discussion within a family that someone shared that the first yard site of their adult child was approaching it was actually the next day he was struggling with what to make of that marker in time the first yard site and he was filled with a lot of different emotions related to the first yard site. Anxiety, reopening pain that had seemed to become manageable over time, refreshed anger at God and at cancer. The yard site day is unique. It was a point in time he could focus his heartache on and also his tenderness. But he continued, he explained how as he was describing this to his surviving adult child, Sue, how about how they were reaching this moment together, Sue became upset with her father. Paraphrasing, I don't need a single day. I miss him every day. He is dead every day, so creating a single moment like this seems silly to me. The dad was struggling because both are true. We talked about how Sue's emotions about that day did not have to be expressed the same way as her dad's. They would each find their way through the day, even if they didn't share the same rituals of the day. Maybe they ate his favorite dinner together that night or other activities. The foundational question, though, is important. Is a particular day more important than each day? There is not a single answer to this question, of course. Lord Rabbi Jonathan Sachs wrote an article in 2023 titled The Limits of Grief, which can inform us on this question. And Rabbi Sachs wrote, it is about behavior at a time of bereavement. We are commanded not to engage in excessive rituals of grief, to lose a close member of one's family is a shattering experience, he said. It is as if some, something of ourselves has died too. Not to grieve is wrong, inhuman, Sachs says. Judaism does not command a stoic indifference in the face of death. But to give way to wild expressions of sorrow, lacerating one's flesh, tearing out one's hair, is also wrong. It is, the Torah suggests, not fitting to a holy people. The Torah sees such behavior is incompatible with Kiddushah, with holiness. The question remains, however, what has restraint in mourning to do with being children of the Lord your God, a holy and chosen people? I'll insert that while Rabbi Sachs is about to bring sources to us from our tradition, each has a theological assertion worth exploring and maybe even challenging at some point. But this is how he continues. He, Rabbi Sachs, brings Ibn Ezra into the conversation, saying that just as a father may cause a child pain for his or her long-term good, so God sometimes brings us pain. Here, bereavement, which we must accept and trust without excessive show of grief. Rabbi Sachs teaches in the name of Ibn Ezra. Or Rabbi Sachs also brings Nachmanides, the Ramban, who suggests that it is our belief in the immortality of the soul that is why we should grie not grieve over much. Even so, he adds, we are right to mourn within the parameter set by Jewish law, since even if death is only a parting, every parting is painful. And uh, Rabbi Ovadia Sforno and the Chizkuni say that because we are children of God, we are never completely orphaned. We may lose our earthly parents, but never our ultimate father. Hence, there is a limit to our grief because we are never alone. Rabbi Sachs continues, whichever of these explanations speaks most strongly to us, the principle is clear. Here is how Maimonides sets out the law. Whoever does not mourn the dead in the manner enjoined by the rabbis is cruel 
Sachs says perhaps a better translation would be lacking in sensitivity. At the same time, however, one should not indulge in excessive grief over one's dead. Halakha, Jewish law, strives to create a balance between too much and too little grief. Hence, the various stages of bereavement. Anenut, the period between death and burial. Shiva, of course, the week of mourning. Shloshim, 30 days in the case of other relatives. And, and Shana, the year in the case of parents. Judaism ordains a precisely calibrated sequence of grief from the initial numbing moments of loss to the funeral and the return home to the period of being comforted by friends and the members of the community to a more ex extended time during which one does not engage in activities associated with joy. Sachs concludes, the more we learn about the psychology of bereavement and the stages through which we must pass before loss is healed, so the wisdom of Judaism's ancient laws and customs has become even more clear. I want to add to Rabbi Sachs's insights, though. It is the genius of Judaism that it intuitively understands that grieving does not end at the year. Here we are gathered for some of us years after our loved one has died. And Judaism gives us a space to honor them. While the initial phases of shock and disbelief have faded, our love for them has not. It has been 14 years since my dad died, and my love has not faded. I think about the things he has missed out on, the ways his advice would have helped, the joy he would have shared, and the pride he might have felt. In the balance of how much to mourn, Judaism wants us to formally gather four times a year at Yizker and also on the yard site five times a year to open ourselves to the love we have felt and deeply missed. Sue and her dad are right. We miss our loved ones every day. We do not need a formalized ritual to set to, to tell us that there is a hole in our heart. And having a community ritual that allows all of us together to lift up our love, our memory, our loss, and our resilience is a powerful source of strength for me. I'm standing here not alone, nor are you. Time shapes us. It influences our days and our seasons. There is a season set for everything, a time for every experience under heaven, a time for being born and a time for dying. And there is also a time for mourning and there is a time for us to lean on each other. I pray that as we honor our loved ones now, we have the strength to incorporate the best of their lives into our own and to lean on each other as needed. Amen. Amen.